Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre, hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond, sometimes even from the beyond. You can find us on YouTube at Terror in Tandem, on Instagram at Terror in Tandem, and you'll always find our latest episode on our website, terrorintandem.com. Nice. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. For thanks for joining, joining us, us again. On this freezing cold day. Well, it could be rainy where you are. It is actually sunny today. Yeah. Uh, to our West Coast friends, um, hope you're doing okay with that crazy weather that the rest of us call rain. Yeah. Nothing better to do when you're trying to stay warm and dry then listen to a podcast uh, wasn't it rage against machine that said i'm rowing down rodeo in a kayak i don't know um anyway i, I thought that was true beverly hills so that's the last dad joke i'll be telling for this five minute segment anyway what uh i'm excited about today i am i'm looking forward to it i think we have a fun episode planned well, to it we're here I am looking forward to what is happening There's nothing right now. to look forward to. You just be present in the moment and record this episode because it's here. I and it's now. Already can't wait for this to be over. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be talking about weapons of choice. Weapons of choice. Horror weapons of choice. And lest ye be afraid, don't worry. We're going to be covering all different kinds of weapons. Good guy weapons, bad guy weapons, pointy Spinny, shooty, yeah. stabby. We're going to be talking about weapons of choice by mm. um, our beloved killers of the horror genre and survivors. That's as the well, thing, you know, when you think, are forced into being killers. When you think of the the truly iconic, either um, final girls, survivors, or killers, they're usually tied to a specific weapon that is just for them, like. Yeah. Leatherface has the chainsaw. Jason's got a machete. I mean, Jason uses everything, yeah. including like a zipped up sleeping bag and a campfire. But And we're going to talk about our favorite examples of these weapons. And yeah, this is like wields them. when you picture this person, you picture them carrying this weapon. Correct. Um, and I would say that one of the more recognizable things of the, you know, horror villains or heroes is the type of weapon they use and why they use it and why they use it or where they happen upon it what um, that adds to the character and uh, maybe we could discuss a little bit the practicality of it and what's different about this too this genre of film is that a lot of horror films don't involve guns yes as weapons yes Not because to gun like a western they're cheap is and guns, lame you know yeah but it's all sorts of things, hammers, arrows, axes. Um, and it's really where the slasher. I mean, with a couple of exceptions, from. like, like it's a um, slasher because you're slashing it with a weapon. Like Carnage Park, which was about a sniper. Yeah. Um, actually, it was pretty good. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's the visceral, up close, passionate, hot blooded nature of, of melee weaponry that usually plays into horror because that allows for more tension and you know yeah and a lot and, and of, more like you know violence <laughs> you can definitely look into the phallic symbolism of some of the weapons that some of these people choose true um, and also most of them are handheld weapons mm. um that involve like surprise element close contact um you know pleasurable penetration good what damn i can't wait to get to your list well, I, I'm not going to do all phallic, but I'm just saying it's known oh my God. to be. Are you going to do the strap on from seven? No. <sighs> Yikes. That was a moment. Yeah. I swear, I still remember seeing that in the theater. And it took me, I was like 16, I think. And it took me a second before I realized what that was. And I remember it clicking and being like, Jesus fucking Christ. Oh my God. It's just what I'm saying is there's a level of intimacy that comes with choosing a weapon to use as your weapon of choice. Absolutely. The gun is the coward's weapon for sure. I mean, you, you yeah, there's no intimacy between you yeah. and the victim. Yeah. Or you and, you know, you trying. some to horror movies have managed to use 
guns very effectively, but it's yeah. definitely and there is one weapon of choice that is a gun that I will be. I've got about. those two, and it, it but it's a stylistic choice, and you're absolutely yeah. right that the majority of weaponry in horror movies is 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 more old school. I thought we could start out with what our weapons of choices would be Ooh. as villains. As villains, yes. which which we would never be. No. I can you can tell trust you what us. Mine would be. You can trust us. I'll just throw it out there. If I were like trying to defend mm-hmm. myself, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Well, you said conf- you're the villain." I know. I'm just gonna throw out what mine would be okay. if I were just defending. It would be something like a baseball bat, okay, or a big curtain rod, or something like that. Okay, a big curtain. <laughs> Those curtain rods could be heavy. No, dude. definitely. Let's just back up for a second. So, in in your fantasy, they're light enough about to hold, weapons, but they're heavy enough to hurt. You are going with curtain rods. I'm just thinking about what's around the house that you sure. could easily grab. I didn't know we were going practicality. I, I mean, yeah, I'm talking about rod. defending myself. That means you that are I'm full being on Jason Bourne. Attacked. Everything in your hands is a weapon. <laughs> Anyway, you want to talk about your evil no? I want to get more choice? into you beating monsters with a curtain rod. I mean, I'm picturing Dracula with, you know, half of our curtain, our shower curtain just sticking out of his chest like, no, not again. Okay, I'm sorry. I I don't mean to make fun of of that. It's just that 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 threw me. I'm I am now really, really wanting to see a movie with a horror protagonist that largely dispatches people with curtain rods. Um, My weapon of choice is a katana. A oh, Japanese samurai sword. And I'll let you know a couple of reasons why. Number one, sharp as fuck. You keep that shit honed to a razor's edge. And that gives you something to do at night when you're like brooding over your lost love and everyone you know is gone in the apocalypse. You can just slowly run a whetstone over your blade and stare into the fire. But also no ammunition needed. You just got to keep it oiled and sharpened. And you can cut zombie heads off. You can stab vampire. You can put some silver or holy water on it to stab vampires with. Oh, it's so you're only existing in the sci-fi universe? It is a versatile weapon. Also, if I'm just going after people, if let's say I'm the villain, if I start running at a motherfucker with a samurai sword, it causes a moment of shock, I think, in the victim of like, it, they take a second for their brain to register. Is this man running at like me that with guy a sword? At the Scientology Center? Yeah. Okay. Quick aside. When Laura and I lived in Los Angeles, um, we used to love going to the the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, which was right across the street from the Scientology Celebrity Compound, which is just as normal as you think it is. And while we lived there, some dude got shot full of holes by security for storming the compound, waving I think two samurai swords and screaming. Which, I'm not really an advocate for gun violence, but it seems like a a scenario in which shooting someone is warranted. But um, no, I wouldn't use it for that. But a katana, man. Listen, Ask Me Shown from The Walking Dead, that shit lasts for years, you know? So that's interesting because I am a killer in this villain scenario and I want concealment. You have no concealment with your weapon. Absolutely do. No. I can put that under a trench coat. I guess, but then you're wearing a trench coat. Which is rad. Yeah. Du- let's call it a duster. Well, I'm well, wearing a duster, which is awesome. <laughs> so my approach is totally different. So and I can I, like uh, sh- I can throw it off in slow motion as doves take off behind me and, you know, pull out my samurai sword. This is just if John Woo is directing my apocalypse. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's very sci-fi of you. Thank you. Um so I, I will allow it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I, on the other hand. Um, beating people with blunt curtain rods. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, on the other hand, would use a combination of two weapons. One is like a, a sort of homemade piano wire on like wooden handles. A garrote? Yeah. Oh, God. And uh needle filled with cyanide or something okay so now you're straight up Paralytic. serial killer weaponry yeah yeah i yeah. am a villain yeah i don't want to be seen or known a garage is so messy well it's also i am i'm short yeah so i need to have the advantage somehow yeah. and the only real way that i can have the advantage is 
like coming from behind or sneaking up on someone. Like the thing if that I can get Tony Collette enough, used to saw her own head off in Hereditary. Yeah. I mean, nice. if I can get close enough to just inject the paralytic, yeah, then okay. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Then, oh, ow, oh, sting. What was that? <laughs> and then smother the person oh, so with a tired. pillow. Um, whatever's on hand. A curtain. Curtain rod. Well, no. Just the curtain. Will well, after you're done beating your victims with the head. curtain rod, you can wrap them in the curtain. Yeah. I Listen, would say this is what's in my pocket. FBI, okay. we are kidding. This is this this is what's in my pocket. I trap ants a and take them outside. A hypodermic needle so. kit with injectables. Okay. Yeah. Or a, like, um, what about like a, a dart gun? No. No? Oh, you're getting right up on these motherfuckers. Yeah. I mean, I will probably lure people. Oh, places. you black widow. Um, or just like walk up to them. You know, like if you're at a bar and you're asking for a drink, you can get really close to a stranger enough so that your hand, one hand could be injecting them while the other is trying to flag down the bartender. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you were looking what I'm doing, yeah. actually it's <laughs> doing the, the perfect the motion. Yeah. Definitely inject somebody in a crowded bar surrounded by people. Um, what? Well, how all would right. anyone ever know? No, no. You? And then you could pretend they're drunk and you're taking them out and be like, oh, he does this all the time. I'm so embarrassed. And or just you could wait until they're taken out. Kind of put put them in the I car and yeah, yeah. to mm-hmm. your plastic your sheet cab. covered. Oh, do you need an Uber? I'm your Uber. Yeah. Anyway, so. What's the, wh- why are you taking me to a shipping container? Back to what's in my pocket. Mm-hmm. My syringe kit, my piano wire possibly a plastic and bag. i'm just wandering around in a duster with a samurai sword and possibly a plastic bag and an electric guitar because you could inject them with the paralytic throw the plastic bag over the top of their head and then use the garrote like within 30 seconds of each other i should mention i also carry an electric guitar with a built-in amplifier um so that when i dispatch my victims i can rock out over their bodies because then that would be like disoriented inject them bleh. like a flying v anyway so um that so now that is... we've written up our own fbi files you're welcome um do you want to get into fake stuff that other people do yeah um sure fake stuff i had sort of i don't know what you did Let, let's check in i broke this down into two categories good guys and bad guys and i chose a few of each and i i i kind of you know just sort of go through the the pros, the description and the pros and cons of using a weapon like this. I mean, I could talk about my good guys first. Let's do it. You want to start with good guys? Sure. All right, good guys. Arm up because evil's a coming. My first good guy is Sean from Sean of the Dead. <laughs> oh, yes. Using the cricket bat. Yes, the everyman. The relatable schlub, the guy just trying his best. Specifically, the century cricket bat. But I first want to back up and talk about the Winchester rifle from above the bar because it was a really great literal Chekhov's gun reference. It's also kind of like a MacGuffin, the thing that they're chasing through the movie. Of course. And it's something that was debated in the film and was fun wondering between the characters before any of this darkness happened you know before any of the zombies happened and they were like oh one of them ed thought it always shot and sean wasn't convinced and sean just hearing the one that accidentally shoots it off that you have to go on an odyssey to get one antiquated gun tells you that this is in england and not america where you could just sort of turn to your left and pick up 17 guns lying around but while I why I love this uh weapon the the sentry cricket bat is because it's um, it's really how the uh, sort of introduction of the cricket bat comes into mm-hmm. the, the film after Sean and Ed exhaust themselves by throwing all kinds of objects that they have in a box at the zombies outside the, their home. Um, Including several records. Well, then they go in and find <laughs> his record collection and they reluctantly throw records but like only the bad ones sean is like no not that one that's a you know that's a a a limited edition and it doesn't work the the vinyls and all the other things don't work and ed and sean go into the shed um ed played by the the incredible nick frost yep um they go into the shed and ed grabs a shovel and sean grabs his cricket bat 
and it becomes sort of a personal and reliable weapon that Sean finds his final blast of confidence using. Yeah. You know, when he starts to wield that, he then becomes confident. Yeah, he gets all badass. And, and he just, he you know. Starts giving directions. Takes their heads yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, it's and a I perfect can... bat for, uh, it's a perfect weapon to fight zombies because it doesn't make noise. Yes. It doesn't break. Yep. And it does the job. And also, I can see this weapon being something that he always has with him. Yeah. Over time. Because yeah, you can yeah, see yeah. at the end when he's sitting um, playing videos yeah. with Ed, zombie Ed, yeah. he has the cricket bat. Yeah. Propped up next to him. I, I would Ready to go. I wouldn't get rid of it. Yeah, he could put little notches in it for all his kills. So I just, I really think that's a good weapon. It's a um, dope weapon. Yeah. And also it's hilarious because cricket is traditionally a sport associated with sort of upper class society, at least uh, classically, that not so much recently, but it was, you know, a very kind of hoity-toity sport. And the idea of these two very solidly middle class dudes um, just braining zombies with one is hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. So my first good guy weapon is obviously, obviously I'm going with Ashley Williams boomstick chainsaw arm combination from uh, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, uh, Ash versus Army of Darkness, and, you know, most of them. So um, this was first introduced in the first movie, but it really, really took off in the second one. Now, um, it's a double the boomstick is a double barrel shotgun and the chainsaw is a home light this is now according to a source I go back to very often the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum um, which has uh, one of these on display it, it's a home light XL12 first introduced mm. in 1963 is the world's first lightweight chainsaw portable chainsaw uh, only 12 pounds in the second movie, they upgraded it to a newer model that only weighed eight pounds. Then they made some modifications because Home Light doesn't make a chainsaw that fits over your arm stump. Home Light repairs, Home Light replace. Close. So I know. <laughs> um, now I chose this because it's incredible, it's iconic, it's become ubiquitous in pop culture. Even people that don't know this have heard Boomstick. Um, you know, the Duke Nukem video games, very classically ripped off all of Ash's dialogue and kind of carried that into the larger consciousness. But listen, it's a conversation piece for one thing, you know, hard to uh, not ask about the chainsaw that is grafted onto your arm. Mm. Um, it's got the one, two punch of, you know, give him a barrel of the boomstick, hit him with the chainsaw because the only way to stop a deadite is to dismember them. And um, they're intimidating and you get to yell cool things like this is my boomstick and impress the medieval locals if exactly. you're traveling through time. Now, the whole the downsides, and there are some, they both need fuel and or ammunition. So when Ash is blasted back into medieval times in Army of Darkness, they're not as useful. The boomstick requires reloading, and that requires bullets. Um, the uh, chainsaw needs gas, or else you can't really cut with a chainsaw unless it's revving. Um, so that's a downside, but it is iconic it is cool uh it does work it takes seemingly a lot of shots and work to kill a deadite but that might just be the resiliency of deadites uh there like he never it, it always seems like he has to shoot him like 80 times mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they come back anyway it's uh, the, the rules are fast and loose but i'm i'm going with ash's boomstick arm chainsaw because nice. it is in his own words groovy that's a good one that's a good one for sure. Um, all right. Let's uh, go to my next heroin. Ooh. The pulse rifle. Oh, shit. Yeah. From Aliens. Yes. And Aliens 3. Used by Ripley. Um, no, it wasn't in Alien 3. Yes. Yes. Like maybe at the very beginning? Yeah, wait. Don't interrupt. Don't so... Um, Known as Ripley's Flamethrower is a combo weapon used by Ellen Ripley in Aliens and Aliens 3. So Aliens in 1986 and Aliens 3 in 1992. It's given to Ripley by Hicks, played by Michael Bean, who helps her learn how to use it in 
aliens. Yeah. And the pulse rifle first appeared in James Cameron's Aliens, carried by the Colonial Marines and later used by Ripley. It's furnished with futuristic custom-made aluminum shell painted in brown Bess paint. Although due to onset lighting, the gun often appears olive green. Several practical weapons capable of firing blanks were constructed for the production, although only one hero prop had a functional shotgun unit. After aliens wrapped, the rifles were broken down and their core guns and dressing components were kept. They were then rebuilt for the production of Alien 3 using different components, although new shrouds were made from vacuum formed plastic based on the original Aliens metal one. The weapon is built around a Thompson submachine gun, Ooh. which has sympathetically deactivated, been sympathetically deactivated. It's also featured, uh, features an imitation shotgun made from plastic tubing. Well, it's got, so it's got the, the counter that tells you how many rounds you have left, yep. which is it's incredible. awesome because as they're like screaming and shooting, you can see the numbers dwindling down and you're, you can watch in real time as they run out of ammo. It just adds that tension. Man, James Cameron is the master. And there's it's a got that, grenade launcher. Yeah, the undercarriage grenade yeah. launcher. And it doesn't have the flamethrower. She just straight up attaches a flamethrower to it because having a machine gun and a grenade launcher was not enough for Ellen Ripley. She tapes a flamethrower to the side of it. Yep. Um, I'm assuming because she couldn't find a thermonuclear bomb, uh, which if she could would have just gone on the top somewhere. Yeah, right. So, yeah, although it's not the exact pulse rifle, they did take parts of the pulse rifle and rebuild it and reconstruct it for Aliens 3. So it is Well, actually... Alien 3 famously, the penal colony she lands on had no weaponry. Yeah. So that must have been, there There were a lot of cut scenes, there were a lot of production changes, so maybe that appears in something that didn't make it into the final cut. Yeah, maybe. I didn't look that deep into it, I just It was a very famously enough. troubled production that changed tack a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the pulse rifle. That's dope. Um, well, my next hero weapon is obviously one of the coolest weapons ever created in a horror movie. And I'm talking Reggie Bannister's sawed off quad shotgun, uh, which made its debut in Phantasm 2 and stayed all the way uh, in the series through Phantasm 5. Now, it's made from two Rossi Squire double barrel shotguns. Um, sure. I, I don't know a lot about guns, so... Uh, anyway, now in, in Phantasm 2, when he and um, uh, Michael, sorry, break into uh, the hardware store and they make their guns, Michael makes a flamethrower, he takes two double barrel shotguns and cuts them at, at like a triangle so that they meet at a point. The barrels meet at a point. And then he kind of attaches the four barrels together, puts a grip on the front. And now he can fire four barrels of a shotgun at once. And he uses those to blast the tall man's dwarf minions in half. Um, according to Reggie himself, I think in the fourth movie, I'm getting really good at killing you little motherfuckers <laughs> after he blasts one of them. So this gun looks fucking awesome. That's the number one pro. It's a four barrel shotgun that he made by breaking into a hardware store and Let's not forget that Reggie Bannister's job before fighting the tall man was ice cream salesman. Um, it can cut cool. a minion. It can cut a minion in half in one shot and often does. Um, it's DIY all the way, baby. You know, if you've yeah. got the know-how and uh, a hardware store that sells, you know, guns, which I guess is most American hardware stores, you can just bust in and make one. Surprised that more people haven't done it. Now, the uh, cons of this, the number one con is there is none. It, it, it looks amazing. It really does look amazing. It's the coolest, maybe one of the coolest looking weapons in horror history. But an actual con is it's a one-shot pony. You get one go at this. Now, you're going to shred any fucking thing in front of you, but if you miss or if it doesn't do the job, you've got to load four shells into two breech loading double barrels and that takes a while wow so you'd better hit the first time it's got a slow reload that's actually two cons oh um sorry you got to get up close these are sawed off shotguns so it's got a pretty wide spread but diminishing return so you got to get right up on a dude to, to unleash yeah 
So it is Alec. It is a um projectile weapon, but not one that works past like ten or fifteen feet, really. Like you've really gotta get up in there and start blasting away at uh nightmare dwarfs and tall men. But Reggie Bannister's quad shotgun. It was so popular in the second movie, it appeared in all the other ones. And um, Reggie is just, he's like the ultimate best friend, awesome character, and he deserves to have the awesomest gun. Awesome. I'll double that awesome. And let's hear from one of our sponsors. Triple awesome. When you're at your wit's end and you need a break, you know there's only one place you can turn to. The Bad Seed Babysitting Service, of course. With BSBS, you can cut the BS and get your little nightmare to shut the hell up while you get some much needed fun. While you tear it up in town or just go to a parking lot to scream a while, our specialized sitters can bring your little demon to their knees. Our sitters can make any child behave. The harder they fight, the more our sitters thrive. They love a challenge and have yet to lose. Equipped with their special kit of secret tools, which we can never reveal, the Bad Seed Babysitters will put your child down so you don't have to. We do not claim to have any training, certifications, or licensure. Our sitters are not responsible for death or dismemberment. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. We do not condone nor endorse the people with murderous tendencies who get into the caregiving trade. Welcome back. Oh, yeah. Hi. Oh. Oh. I forgot. I was doing another thing. Oh, hello there, listener. We we didn't notice you. Never, never would ever forget about you, listener. Welcome to our podcast that we just do um, anyway. Let's continue. We do. I mean, we do this out of the kindness of our hearts. You're Let's welcome. Let's go back to other kindness of hearts. Um, I have a couple other Funny her- you should mention heroines ah. um, who don't kind of wield specific weapons, but... I'm going to argue that these are character weapons. Do it. So the first is Sydney Prescott. Mm. And my weapon for her is Perseverance. No kidding. And Nancy Thompson. And my weapon for her is Fearlessness. Yeah. Now. Well done. Sydney Prescott. Everybody knows she's endured. She continues to live her life. She goes into hiding. And Serial when that killers. doesn't work. She comes Executives out of who hiding. don't know how to negotiate paychecks. Yeah. When she doesn't. And that doesn't work. When hiding doesn't work. She fights back. She finds smarter ways to fight. She is always going to be there answering the phone i don't understand why because it all starts on the phone but, but she will she will always double tap a body lying on the ground just to make sure and i'm gonna prove this even further a little bit now i know she wasn't um featured in the most recent film scream six, six. however she was on the red carpet and she was interviewed And they said, would you consider coming back to the Scream franchise? And she basically said, I told them what it would take. I would hate for the franchise to not continue, especially considering how important it was to Wes Craven. And it's important to me. And I would love to be a part of it. But essentially, they know my price. Oh, Nev Campbell, the hero we need. So if know your she worth, can girl. continue to persevere, if, if, the, if, if they can pay Nev Campbell enough, then Sydney Prescott can continue to persevere. Because I know she will. Let's put they it out there. They will not kill her. Let's put it out there. Nev Campbell's doing great. Yeah, Scream franchise? Not as much. Yeah, Scream franchise is not persevering. I feel like they might be giving Nev Campbell a call and being like, oh, hey, so we found some money. Yeah, let's hope. I mean, and bad press. Yeah. So anyway, then on to Nancy Thompson, who from the start, she knows she cannot outrun Freddie because every time she closes her eyes, he's there. He's there. So as she 
tries to stay awake and, and, you know, keep that hope alive. That doesn't work. And then she goes and dives into the dream yeah. to fight Freddy and also in his own territory. She's like 16 years yeah, old. exactly. No adults help her. We've already talked about. I wanna, and we're going to do yeah. a worst parents quick, episode quick, in a couple quick, of weeks. So alternate superpower of hers is um, persevering despite the world's worst fucking parents. Yeah. Well, she, hers is fearlessness, but um, F- fearlessness in the face <laughs> of just even by 80 standards. Awful parent. But she never gives up on fighting Freddy no. Krueger. No. That is his ultimate nemesis is Nancy Thompson. And unlike Glenn, she can stay awake at night. Yeah, she can. And she sticks to it and she's not afraid. Even R. R. if Glenn. she is afraid and like, you know, crying or screaming, she faces those fears and goes after Freddy. So you know, it, it just occurred to me um, that Johnny Depp being sucked into his bed in that movie yeah. and vomited out as a gallons of blood is only the second worst thing to happen in Johnny Depp's bed. But um bum. Huh. Anyway, so those are my final heroines and their weapons of choice. Nice. That really I've good. chosen for them. Really good. I I love it. Character and weapons those are, are just weapons. as yes. don't your wits are weapons. Yes. You put a the the world's greatest weapon in the hands of a you know, a turd, they're not going to do anything with it. You got to get a Sydney Prescott up in there. You know, what do they say about journalists or writers? Like their weapon, you know, the your pen. pen is your weapon. Yeah. So wield it well. Correct. I am going old school with my final good guy weapon and it's wooden stakes, baby. Oh yeah. The Wampiers classic of the world. Wooden Watch steak. out. Keep it analog. What has killed more monsters oh. than a sharpened piece of wood? I don't know. Right? So, now the wooden stake, um, in historical reference, was actually practiced. Um, the, the practice of staking bodies to their coffin was a way to get them from not rising from the dead. Now, this belief um, came about... A couple of different ways. We're talking like the 12th oh, you mean century. Just like regular people? Yeah, the 12th century, 13th century. This is the time when maybe somebody got buried and they weren't quite dead yet. Or a body was exhumed and it was found to be bloated with gases and looked very different because we didn't really understand the science of decay. So it looked like a monster. So things like that. So what um, the Norse would do with their draugr, which is their word for their like undead zombie monsters, is they would just drive a, an impalement pole through the body, nailing it into the coffin. Um, the uh, Brits would do it. The Slavs uh, used wooden stakes. But it wasn't so much to pierce the heart. It was to keep them pinned in the coffin so they couldn't climb out of it. Mm. Now, the Brits <laughs> used to do this um, trigger warning, because this is real, to suicides. So if you committed suicide, which is... Uh, to the wonderfully inclusive Christian religion, a mortal sin that damns your soul to hell for eternity no matter what you did in life, they would drag the body through the street, bury it at a crossroads in unconsecrated unconsecrated grounds, and they would often stake the body to the coffin so that it couldn't rise. Now, this was known as crossroads burials, and it was banned by Parliament in 1823, Wow, which is a long time ago, but not that long ago it's long yeah but it's i feel like ago. in the 19th century ago. if you're still doing that you know what i feel like people are still fucking doing it so anyway wouldn't <laughs> this is kind of where that evolved but well, it you definitely in your own backyard it's none of my business it definitely took off when bram stoker popularized it in um the novel dracula now um so that's the historical shit it's been seen in every vampire movie ever Mm-hmm. Now, the effects of it kind of differ. Um, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, it makes Lucy vomit tons and tons of blood, which is pretty awesome. In Buffy, they turn to ash like immediately. Um, in Blade, too, they turn into like little piles of ash. Sometimes they burst into flames. Sometimes they scream and melt. And other times it's quieter. Uh, really just depends on who's writing it. But the pros of this, best of both worlds, right? So you can either spend your brooding time 
uh, sitting in front of a roaring fire in a mahogany library, uh, sharpening, you know, ashwood stakes slowly and polishing them as you think about your dead family that was taken by vampires. Mm -hmm. Or in the middle of a fight, you can just kick off a chair leg and ram it through a vampire's chest. I mean, it's just... It's exactly, any piece of wood. Ultimate versatility. Take the handle from your pocket garage. You can easily pull out like a leather case with bespoke stakes. Oh, yeah. Or you can just, you know, kick somebody into like a pool cue. Um, what? Okay. The other, oh, no, go ahead. Because um, sometimes it's from like a special tree. Sometimes it is from the ash tree. Yeah. Yes. Um, in some myths, it has to be from the ash mm-hmm. tree, but it's mostly just kind of been any wood. I think it would be funny to watch somebody try to stab a vampire with like a piece of Ikea furniture to find out that that's not real wood and it doesn't work. Yeah. They're or a like, piece yeah, of that's... Subway bread. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, that oh, actually it is works. wood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the other thing is they're portable and you can carry a bunch of them. You know, it's pretty easy to carry a duffel bag full of wooden stakes. You can clear out a whole nest. Um, and the pleasing, I, I mentioned this earlier, but the pleasing death effects, whether it's bursting into flames, turning to ash or vomiting blood all over your, your, uh, assistant, those are all great ways to go. If yeah. you're going through the trouble of dispatching a nest of vampires, yeah, why not? Why not? Now it does have some cons. Um, it's kind of basic. Yeah. I mean, unless you're making that bespoke vampire collector set uh, that you can get at sharper image it's just yeah, a piece of wood listen if it works does the it job works. sure i'm just saying from a stylistic perspective you know you've got ash's chainsaw hand and then you've got a sharpened pool cue yeah um it's an, another up close and personal weapon now you're human they're vampires there's a reason why you hunt them during the day when they're asleep because you don't want to get up and close to a vampire. They're much stronger. They're much faster. And getting up and close to you is kind of how they do their thing. Yeah. So that's why you try to go in the morning time. Unless you're Blade and you've got superpowers. The other thing is splinters. Wear gloves. Yeah. Tell me about it. You uh, always see Van Helsing uh, you wearing those gloves. Every, anywhere. Yeah. At any time. Oh, listen. We just had a splinter experience in Tarantan headquarters that was grisly. It was. It we was. We had an experience of where. Not cute. A, like at least a one inch splinter was, was like removed legit from. Legit a. Impalement. Uh, it was like could have been classified as a twig. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It was like it needed to be pulled out. Puncture wound. Yeah. Fucked up. Anyway, wear gloves if you're staking, folks. Yeah, uh, Van Helsing do. wears those cool brown riding gloves, you know. But um, I think part of that is to not get those nasty splinters, which in Van Helsing times was basically a death sentence. Yeah, I know because of all the, the other medical. Disease. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, so that's my good guy weapon pertoire. Same, and um, but let's not forget who else uses weapons: bad guys and they girls. Sure do. Um, I'm going to jump right in with my first villain's weapon. And it's good old coming for you, Freddy Krueger. Oh, the 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 glove that is a totally normal thing used for trimming hedges? The claw glove. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you see someone wearing that, you just automatically assume, "Oh, you're going to go prune a bush." From Nightmare on Elm Street fame as Nancy Thompson has her Fearlessness, Freddy Krueger has a claw glove. So Wes Craven was inspired by his pet cat as he watched him clawing his couch apart. Yeah. So Freddy's glove was intended to make the character memorable. So Jim Doyle created the glove. Well done. He and Wes Craven went to look for knives that could be used in the glove. They landed on a steak knife shape, steak Mm -hmm. knives. Yeah. And they decided to use them upside down. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So his glove is actually. Because they kind of look like fingers that yeah. way. Yeah. His glove is actually made up of 14 different parts. It doesn't just have the knives. No. But it also it's, has it, they, nails. They, they, sh- they show him like um, building it. Yeah. And he's, it's like a whole mechanism and shit. Yeah. All um, with leather and burlap. <sighs> uh, so if other horror characters wore this razor glove maybe it wouldn't be as impactful because freddy krueger is you know a burn victim and such a personality and the sweater situation yeah yeah. he's also in robert england really hams it up so the homemade glove of it all yeah it's sort of that maintenance man 
underground pipe dwelling. And it plays a big part into the early part of the first movie because, you know, you don't see the glove at first, but you do see um, Nancy's friend being ripped Slashed. apart by the glove, the, like an which animal. is invisible. Yeah. And the cops uh, who, by the way, just do an incredible job, r- great detective work in this movie, they... Um, they are puzzled by the fact that they're, you know, four, like, equal blade cuts yeah, in, a, exactly. in a row. Yeah. And and what's interesting is, especially early on in the Nightmare on Elm Streets, is Freddy Krueger carefully constructs this weapon. Yeah, like... like uh, and the only purpose is to kill young people. Yes. He, like, let's he not doesn't forget, do it to defend himself. He's a child himself. killer. Yes. He does it to invade people's dreams and kill young people. In a terrible way. Fred is um, not a nice man. So the glove, the razor glove is what, you know, claw glove, razor glove. It, it really works with his aesthetics, as we mentioned. And he's a pretty frail man. Yeah, he's gangly. Um, and so, you know, like if you think about Jason Voorhees, right? Yeah, like a hulking monster. Or even uh, Michael Myers. Face. Yeah, but the other face is enormous. Right. Yeah. He's like a slighter man. Yeah. And he's also tall and put upon lanky. by, you know, his life. Yeah. And how it was ended or burnt. Mangled. Yeah. Um, it it actually gives him this power that he normally wouldn't have had. Yeah, yeah. He's not physically imposing enough himself. It's and the only that, that's, weapon that fits with him. That's kind of the he way they... couldn't f- wield a big machete. They fight back against Freddy in a couple of the movies by making him insignificant. Well, yeah, with his supernatural powers, um, that's a weapon as well. Yeah, I mean, he can turn Entering into a, a gross tongue that licks you through the phone. But what's... What's the end goal? It's to kill young people. With and the razor needs glove, yeah. something to do yeah. that. Yeah. And licking them with the forked tongue isn't going to work. No, no. That's preamble to the razor glove. So it's iconic. It's, you know, an everyman tool. Everyone knows it when they see it. They absolutely do. It's if been you referenced ever dress in up countless like Freddy other Kruger, movies. you must. Yeah. You can't have the costume Conversely, without Conversely, Edward Scissorhands, good. Oh, totally. But Freddy Krueger, bad. Mm, mm. Freddy Scissorhands, the yeah. crossover we've all been waiting oh for. Oh, my God. Um, my uh, good guy weaponry, my bad, excuse me. Eddie Krueger. Bad guy weaponry. Going to go into people's dreams and give them haircuts. <laughs> no, Trim wait, their wait, wait, wait. That's what it could be. It could be Ed Edward Krueger. Is going to go into your dreams if you don't go to get your hair cut. So either he's going to do it while you're dreaming. I woke up. Or I'm going to take you to the barber. And kid. I had this lovely bouffant and my front hedges are shaped like a manatee. Edward Kruger coming to get you. So my first bad guy weapon, we're going back to Phantasm because I'm going to level with you. It's one of my favorite franchises. I love it so very that much. orb. We're talking the tall man's shiny balls from the Phantasm series. <laughs> yes. The balls. See, everyone, we were talking about phallic, phallic. They make, and you can't have a phallus without the fruit basket. The chalice. Oh, excellent. (laughs) Anyway, these were designed by Willard Green, who sadly passed away uh, before the movie was released. So he never got to see his creation on screen, unfortunately, which is a real shame because these things turned out great. Now, Phantasm was an independent movie shot on almost nothing on the weekends. Um, it was a real scrappy production. So these balls, they um, in Phantasm lore, the tall man steals bodies and he crushes the brain down of his victims and puts them inside these silver spheres that fly around and they have blades and drills in them and they, you know, kill people. And the way that they normally do it, they do it in the first movie, is uh, fly right into your forehead, drill in, and then suck all your brain blood out. Mm. Um, it's pretty awesome. Now, the way that they made these effects work in the movie is um, Don Coscarelli, the writer and director uh, um, and director of the first four Phantasm movies, he hired professional pitchers to throw these things down the hallway yeah. and then filmed it in reverse um, because it's pretty hard to throw a silver ball into someone's forehead. So they would have it like attached to the forehead and then throw it off of them. Uh, you know, and just film it in reverse, and it all looks really great. Mm-hmm. It's very cool looking. It's become 
synonymous with the series, these these floating silver balls of death. Now, the pro, they're cool and they're scary. I mean, they go very quickly. They've got all sorts of blades. Um, they're lethal. And um, yeah, once one of them starts chasing you, it's uh, pretty hard to get away from. Yeah. Another definitely. pro sucks out your brain juice. You know, that's uh, something that you really want automated. It's just tough to do on your own. So if you've got a, a, a machine that can suck out brain juices for you, why not? Um, one is deadly, but a swarm of them ends the world. It, it actually, that is essentially what happens by the fifth movie. Um, now, they are some, there are some cons. They're not easy to make. As I said, you've got to steal a body, do some weird alien techno babble to it, crunch a brain down, and shove it in a weird sphere. That's a lot of work. Yeah. You got to take an entire afternoon. Oh, he does use the bodies, crushes them down into dwarf monsters. So like the Native American, the tall man uses all parts of the body. Um, now, it can't tell friend from foe. In uh, Phantasm 2, it oh, kind of famously great. kills a bunch of his own henchmen. Uh, they just sort of float around and, you know, shoot blades at people. And um, the other con is, yeah, as you probably got from my introduction and every part of this segment, people are constantly going to be making jokes about your balls, your shiny, shiny silver balls. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, sure, honestly, sure. how, how many times do you want to hear that as an immortal? Right. Yeah. So the tall man's deadly balls. <laughs> That's my number one bad guy weapon. Nice. Balls. Um, my next is going along with my heroines. I'm going to talk about the hunting knife from Scream, used by the killer Ghostface. Yes. Um, so it's a buck one twenty hunting knife specifically. Yikes. Um, and Scream. It looks uh, so nasty. The Scream franchise has modified the buck one twenty. Yeah. It's commonly an eight inch hunting knife, but. They actually feature a fuller beveled top of the blade to help lighten it. And the knife itself features a clip point blade, typical of a Bowie style knife. The knives used in the film series are made with aluminum with solid wood handles or metallic painted rubber blades with rubber handles for prop knives. And yeah, yeah. Knives. No, but nobody's throwing no. knives at Nev Campbell. Let's just put that put that out there and in scream four they use cgi to make the knife appear as if it was going into the flesh nope the handle itself is made of black um phenolic no idea um with finger grooves and curved a curved chrome tip in the first three films it's a bespoke knife yeah like it is it when he first flashes it it was no surprise that it was like two privileged rich kid high school shits because that's not like a poor kid's murder weapon. Yeah. So like they changed it up a little for Scream 4. Yeah. Um, but Wes Craven basically is the creator of this as well. <laughs> a lot of these weapons. Um, and he wanted this masked killer, which we talked about in our masks episode, who goes after... Th- like teens, young adults, um, with his pop culture movie trivia. Yeah. And he slaughters everybody with this hunting knife. And it's basically synonymous with Ghostface. Like, you never see Ghostface without it unless he's being attacked or it's been kicked out of his hand. But it's always there. And one of the most iconic thing that Ghostface does is he takes his cloakings... And wipes the blade off yeah. of the last person's blood. Yeah, that's to like to stab more. That's a move. Yeah, that's a that's a that's like a swagger. Iconic. Yeah, for sure. That has to happen in order to stab the next person. You have to have the knife, the robe, and the mask to be Ghostface. And he's also really, you know, he's like, I don't want to cross contaminate. <laughs> he. COVID was a big concern for Ghostface. <laughs> exactly. Had, well, he already actually, had a mask built in. He put an N95 filter in on the inside of that mask. There is mesh yeah. on the inside of that yeah. mask. So, yeah. And he does have that voice concealment thing. Right. So right. I think he's all set. That he's all set. So my next... Um, Do you want to 
watch a scary movie. My next bad guy um, weapon is the puzzle box, a.k.a. the Le Marchand box, the Lament configuration. It's the box that summons Cenobites from uh, made its debut in Clive Barker's novella The Hellbound Heart and has appeared in every Hellraiser movie the three good ones and the rest of them Mm -hmm. now um in the novella it was black um but in the movie it was designed by the uh the late great simon sace who made a beautiful sace makes it makes a beautiful gold inlaid intricate puzzle box with sections and different configurations it's really quite something it was so he made two of them for the movie and it was so hard to make and valuable that in the scene where Kirsty throws it out of the window in the house uh, they actually had a team of people on the outside um, to catch it because wow. they they could not afford to th- this was handcrafted by this man it, it took a long time to do he also worked on Lair of the White Worm which is a very underseen Hugh Grant horror comedy um based on the Bram Stoker story. So um, now the puzzle box, it's got some pros. Number one, obviously, it unleashes Cenobites. It's a puzzle. Yeah. It um, it, it opens the gateway. That's a pro? You're calling that releasing of the Cenobites a pro? Well, this is if you're using it as a villain. Okay. This is the pro of this villainous weapon. It unleashes Cenobites. Yeah, but they don't necessarily distinguish between the person opening it. Hey, Anne. That's not my problem. Okay. That's 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 the box opener's problem. So they're gross. They do gross things um, in gross ways. And they, they yeah, the chatterer, um, you know, Angelique, eventually, uh, Pinhead, and all the other gross ones. Um, now they are fueled by that most infinite and reliable resource, human weakness. This puzzle box will always work because humans will always do things they know they shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. This is the temptation for people who are burnt out on their hedonistic lifestyles and looking for forbidden pleasures that they shouldn't be. So it definitely has an element of, well, you fucked around and you found out, but in other installments and in other ways, this box has definitely been used to victimize people. Uh, the other pro, it's cool. It's just cool. It looks cool. It does cool things. It could be a nice little bric-a-brac in your home. Well, that's that the you thing. Just leave it there. This design has become just leave it. so famous and so ubiquitous that it, it actually is featured in like tons and tons of merchandise. Now, um, the pro, the, the, the cons. I said one of the pros is it unleashes Cenobites, and uh, one of the cons is it unleashes Cenobites. <laughs> exactly. So um, hope you like BDSM and pontificating slowly, yeah. because um, it's either that or chain, actually that and chain hooks. Nothing good happens. Mm-mm. Nothing good. And like you mentioned, they're not a direct weapon. You just sort of let them loose, yeah. and they do what they're going to do. That pole. Oh, God, yeah, the nasty, gory pole. Um, so the other thing is exclusivity. Who fixes this fucking thing if it Nobody. breaks? It was made by a, a French toy maker named Le Marchand in the 17th century. I don't think it's able to be broken. Who knows? But if you drop it and it snaps, Pinhead's going to be like, oh, the, no. The pro is also that you can use it to get the Cenobites back in. The clasp has been broken. So, um, you heard it's also, yeah, it's not for the active killer. This is very much a set and wait kind of thing. Yeah. You don't know what you're getting into. Just stop playing with the puzzle. Well, that's, that's, that's for anybody finding the puzzle. Don't touch it. Um, but, uh, and, and if a bug eating vagrant hands you one, just, you know, be on your way. Somebody mysterious on your travels in Istanbul. Yeah. Gives or wherever. It to you at a cafe. Yeah, if someone with like an offensive oriental accent. You if know. it's hot and it ever, this is done in secret. And if you have the dirtiest fingernails anyone's ever yeah. seen. Jesus Ooh, Christ, gross. Frank. Frank. God, Dirty get a toothbrush bastard. or something. But um, it's not for the active killer. If you are, uh, you know, you, you like to roll your sleeves up and bury a knife in somebody. This isn't that kind of thing. You got to set and forget when with the, the, uh, the puzzle box. When the nails off, doesn't matter. It could be 
decades before this thing finds another person. You just sort of have to wait with your, you know, pierced nipples and your leather outfit. So that is the puzzle box. Yay, a door to hell. Don't touch it. So my next and last is a hook hand from Candy Man. Oh, Candy Hook Hand? Yep. So um, is there isn't candy? really an explanation in the original Candy Man of how um, Candy Man, you know, the hook came to be. Well, they, they explain he that lost they, his hand, they but... chop his hand off and then jam a hook into the stump. Yeah. But other than that, it's not. It doesn't really say why really they did that. Correct. Yeah. Like, why did you do this with the hook? So one of the theories is that um, use of the hook in this way is based on that old urban legend that started floating around um, in the 1950s that was the hook man killer. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the couple making out right, at make out point. You hear the hook. Yeah. And then it's that ends one. Up, mm-hmm. Like, I know what you did last summer. Or that, was, that was another hook killer. A uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this hook in particular, it belongs to in the first iteration is Tony Todd. It mm. belongs to Tony Todd, and it's and hard not to really sympathize with Tony Todd's character because of everything we've come to find out. Yeah. Um. So, you know, it's it's a little bit of a conflicting feeling because he is a murderous killer. But he also had some bad shit happen to well, him. He's the embodiment of a curse. Yes. Um, placed on, on you know, us for uh, crimes done to him. Yeah. Um, you know, he was turned into this vicious murderer, yeah. actually, and coated in honey. Well, and he, left out to be stung to death by yeah, he, he dared to fall in love with a white woman as yep. a slave and was brutalized tortured maimed mutilated murdered yeah, and, then and came, covered in honey came to back be stung and to death by bees kills all sorts of people so despite this he when he comes back he's basically just coming back to claim anyone that says his name in the mirror to keep his story going yes correct to keep the urban legend of it all going um and you know I would say that the appearance of Candyman with his hook, again, it's synonymous. It's it's part of who he is and what he does and how he kills with it. And the brutality of it is extremely um, visceral, although they don't always show how bloody and violent the hook killings are. Just think about if you've ever gotten pinched, your, you know, your, your hand taint pinched or a fish hook in your hand or finger. Oh, and it's also one of those like meat hanging hooks. So it curves right. a little so at the end. So like multiply that by a thousand. cruelty to it. Yeah. You get caught with a fish hook. Multiply that by Tony Todd, who is probably six. He's a large three, dude. Yeah. Big dude. And this is like 1992. With a huge hook metal hook yeah also he's undead yeah and that slices right through and there's bees everywhere yeah because they're part of him now it's all bad and it's 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 not attached to him it's just literally jammed into the yeah still bleeding stump Stump. of his mangled arm so it is just extra levels of gross yeah and so the bees you could be scared of bees but i would be much more afraid of the hook and I think that I, I'm hooked. I just I, by Tony Todd. I, I like that Candyman is like just thinking. You know the the meat the the old rusty meat hook coming out of my stump isn't enough. Maybe I should throw bees at them. It's too. similar to Freddy's glove and how this comes to be because um, you know we talked a little bit about. Um, original candy man was a slave and he fell in love with a white woman and so it's really very much you know what's around what's what can i grab what's oh yeah no he was he was lynched yeah you know so they basically were just grabbing farm tools and killing him with him yeah so it's very you know what's around like a curtain rod that i can then use to take out my vengeance. And then come back a uh, hundred years later and fuck up a housing project in Chicago. So the hook. Cool. My last villainous weapon 
it comes from the Saw franchise's Jigsaw. And I know what you're thinking. He's going to talk about the traps. No, the traps are secondary. The real weapon is Jigsaw's terrible pedagogical philosophy. <laughs> now, um, Oh, a little abstract. Yeah. I'm assuming it's because he got his uh, degree in um, classroom management at University of Phoenix. But he, um, <laughs> the whole thing about Jigsaw, right, is... Now, I've seen not every Saw, but more of them than not. I think I've only missed, like, the last three, because why? Um, His whole deal is he is a man who um, actually died uh, in, like, the third movie or something of cancer. Um, So he's dying of cancer when he makes these traps, and it's designed for people he thinks do not appreciate life. And these traps are supposed to teach them the value of life. Now, okay, couple of pros. He's definitely got the vibe down. Ambience, got great lighting. It's got an industrial vibe, like a 1990s Nine Inch Nails video. Um, little steampunk. And, uh, you know, he's got these machines that are like homicidal Rube Goldberg nightmares. You know, yeah. ripping people's heads off. He sews somebody to a car seat. He crushes, I think, Donnie Wahlberg with two blocks of ice. That's pretty cool. Um, sorry, Donnie. It was probably like, oh, ice, ice, baby. And he was like, no. <laughs> that's not me. It's um, on the block. And points for being clever. And he drops somebody in a pit full of needles, you know. Or ice kid on the block. Yeah. Like, I'm saying there's the, he's a smart man and there are levels of irony and I appreciate the work. Um, also, you finally get to put that teaching degree to good use, you know. Uh, everybody said you you should have majored in business. You said no. Nope, I'm gonna get an English degree, and now you're finally using it. Now there are some to- there are some cons here. This takes a lot of time. A lot. Yeah, I mean you have to like get teach, a location, and then you have to have the the people learn, and then put it into. You've got to make the practice. traps. You've got to set the people up. You've got to start a cult full of pig mask wearing weirdos that capture people for you. Um, But also, your reward for surviving this appears to be a spot in his cult. Uh, From what I can gather from watching the Saw movies is that surviving one of these traps, which is a pretty rare occurrence, earns you a spot as one of Jigsaw's pig mask wearing cult members. So don't forget about the TV show. You learn the meaning of life. And then your reward is you get to kidnap more victims for Jigsaw. Cool. Yeah. Lesson learned. Um, and I mean, the, essentially, it's just teaching copycats. The other thing right? is, are you really trying? Correct. To, yeah. He's training people, essentially. The other thing is, are you really trying to teach anybody anything? Because, like, most of them die. Yeah. Um, or is he trying to take the heat off of him and making all of these, like, minions out there so that they'll never well, try I just, I, I, I've, I've have. Uh, some minor classroom experience. And I remember on the first day of training, they they did say the most effective way to make sure your lesson stays with the students is to ensure that you don't butcher them uh, before the end of the lesson. And that's something that, that Jigsaw definitely seems to have left out of his curriculum because in the middle of teaching these people the importance of life, he usually fries them to a crisp or something. And then, like I said, the one that makes it out and learns that, oh, life is something to be appreciated. Congratulations. Here's a pig mask. Go find me some Mm. new suckers. I'm going to strap them to a fucking jet engine. So, yeah, Jigsaw's terrible pedagogical philosophy, possibly one of the more damaging weapons out there in horror films. Awesome. Well, now that we've gone in and out. And in. And above. And out again. And beyond. Through. We're going to... Close it down <laughs> and go home for the night. That sounds great. So we hope you enjoyed this weapon of choice. Think about what you, your weapon of choice. Stock was. up. A lot of you are probably in your cars. That is not a weapon. No, honestly, Please listen. Stop with the road rage. We're talking real life. So if you really feel the need to shoot something, make it a Nerf gun. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I am really not going to sneak up behind you with no. a needle garage and no. a plastic bag. We but... just like movies and books about gross things because there's something wrong with our brains. Well, there's something right with our brains. Nice. Have a good one. Bye. 
Terror in Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Suspanic. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Where's